Welcome everyone. Uh, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm seeing some uh, familiar faces and names and some new friends joining us this evening as well. Uh, we're really excited to have a, a panel of distinguished panelists kind of with us talking about um, uh, different efforts among the private sector to drive population health. Uh, and uh, um, so I think, you know, maybe I can just share a little bit more about the genesis of this uh, today's uh, session. Um, so I think the genesis of today's session is that uh, we realize that private companies are thinking very hard and they're also engaging in unique and innovative efforts to drive population health. Um, and that uh, I think private companies or organizations in the private sector are also aware of the fact that we need to work across silos um, uh, to you know, uh, uh, basically to drive population health issues. Um, but the issue is that you know, many of these efforts and, and the thinking among the private sector is sometimes unknown to our current public health students. So we thought that it'd be a great opportunity to bring uh, um, a distinguished speakers coming together to share a little bit more about their career journeys, what their respective organizations and previous organizations, you know, what are they engaged in to drive population health. Uh, and so this is the genesis of uh, today's talk. And we have um, about, uh, I think, set more than 70 registrants for today. And I think you know, with this week, probably between 90 to 100, uh, many of them will be watching this recording as well. So again, a grand welcome to everyone. Um, so before I introduce the panelists, I would like to mention that we have got two representatives from the Student Healthcare Consulting Club joining us, Anath and Jess. Uh, would either of you want to kind of like talk briefly about the HCO? Yeah, uh, so my name is Anafer. Uh, I go by Anath. I'm the Vice President of Healthcare Consulting Organization at GPH. Um, so we are a team of passionate NYU students energized to gain exposure and experience in the field of healthcare, consulting, policy, and management. Um, so our mission is that we're, we're, we aim to build a strong interdisciplinary group of students with experiences and necessary skills to mirror the needs for innovative solutions to today's healthcare issues. Um, and we, uh, we're trying to get more and more different uh, events going. So if anyone wants to join, just send an email to um, it's edgph.aco at nyu.edu. That's great. Thanks, Anna. And uh, so for all the attendees, you realize that, you know, it's easy for you to submit questions via the Q&A function. Anna and Jess will be helping us to curate the questions, uh, uh, especially, you know, uh, um, as uh, representatives of the HCO club, Anna and Jess will be able to pick out some of the questions that could be more per pertinent or more relevant uh, for the panelists. So without further ado, uh, I would love to introduce um, the panelists. We have uh, Dr. Jason Spangler, who's currently Executive Director um, for Health Technology Assessment, Policy, Strategy and Development, uh, and Engagement, sorry, and MGen. We have uh, Julie Akutin, who's currently Senior Healthcare Strategist at Code and Theory. And then we have Christine Jude, who goes to, by Chris, um, who is currently Vice President at Discern Health. Um, so I will leave uh, each individual to um, each panelist to talk a little bit more about their previous uh, uh, career experiences, their journey, as well as what the organizations are up to. Um, and that's why, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just mentioning their name and title. So I'm, each of them will spend a couple of minutes talking about their experiences. And, uh, and I think, um, Jason, you're up next. Thanks, Alden, um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, happy to answer any questions if people want to interject even while I'm talking. So um, I am a physician by background, uh, trained in preventive medicine and public health, which is actually a public health population health specialty that many people are unaware of, including many physicians, even though it has a, a long and distinguished history. Uh, and so um, I actually have come into the private industry right out of my residency. So there is actually a residency and part of that residency, you get a master's of public health degree um, and then get additional training and kind of population health issues. Um, I, maybe as we get into questions, I'll go into a longer history, but I, I started in the private industry and the pharmaceutical industry uh, at Pfizer and they had a department or a, a section of, of public health, um, which is unique for a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and then I transferred into kind of the nonprofit world. Um, and then I've been at Amgen now for the last nine years with a bunch of roles, both US and global. And currently, uh, as Alden said, I'm in a global role where I work both in the US and the ex-US 
on HTA and payment policy issues? You know, I think the perspective for me, um, it, it's, I didn't come in initially planning on doing what I'm doing now. This was not actually what my plan was. Um, I knew I wanted to be a doctor. And then when I was training to be a doctor, I realized, you know what, I would rather treat populations versus individuals. I feel like I could be more effective that way. And then I was like, well, you know, I'm really interested in, you know, international aspects, travel, international politics. And so I said, well, you know, how can I bring all those things, my interests together? And so I was going to go into international public health. And my plan was to focus on what some of the folks on the on the webinar may be aware of what are called complex humanitarian emergencies, which are basically, you know, areas of natural or man-made disasters. And I was interested in man-made disasters, which most of the time are, is conflict, areas of conflict and what happens out of that. So things like, you know, disaster medicine, refugee health, issues like that, um, food security, and so that's what my plan was. And so when I did my preventive medicine training, I went to a place where they specialized in that. Um, and so I got training in that. And, you know, I had been to places like Africa and Central America. I'd been to Kosovo. I was actually planning on going to Afghanistan in 2002, right after the, the fighting, you know, ended there um, after 9-11 and, and we invaded. And um, it's interesting to think that's yeah, been 20 years now. But so I was planning on doing all this. Then life circumstances changed um, and my interests changed and I kind of um, pivoted from international public health to US health policy. And so I had the opportunity because of where I was, I was actually close to DC um, and I was in a program where they had rotations that I could do at the state level as well as at the federal level. So I got engrossed in kind of state health policy issues and then federal health policy issues. And then I was able to transition into actually, as I said, the pharmaceutical industry where health policy is very important, much more important than most people realize, but also kind of marry population health or public health and health policy together. Uh, and so taking a step back, you know, when you go to, and I'm sure many of you know this, or all of you know this, you know, in your, your training in, in public health schools is there is usually a health policy and management, you know, division or, you know, you know, a, a major, or you can focus on that. And so where I was the same thing. And so that's where I kind of pivoted from international health to health policy and management. And I've been doing that kind of ever since I, you know, one of the things that I was made aware of, and probably what gives most of you some interest in this area is that you know, the private sector has a lot of interest, I would say, in health related issues in general. And so whether it's you know, the industry that I am in or other health related industries, I would say even non health related industries, you'd be surprised that you know, how many financial you know, institutions or organizations are interested in that and, and other types of large industries or businesses and whether it's from the perspective of occupational health or the, you know, the health of their employees, um, whether it's environmental health, since so many of the companies work have some effect on the environment, um, just across all those ranges. And, and in my particular industry, and I've been now in pharma, probably a total of about, you know, 12, 13 years now, um, it, it's not just about you know, developing drugs uh, because we're concerned about the populations and the innovation is for populations as a whole. Um, there is, you know, a strong interest in that. Uh, and so when I started at, at Amgen, where I currently am at, you know, I really emphasize kind of population health in several different ways. One is healthcare quality. Obviously, there's components of healthcare quality in our industry that are important. And so, you know, I actually, one of the reasons I was hired was to lead our healthcare quality efforts. Um, and then the other aspect is, you know, we deal a lot with our customers, which are basically our payers, whether it's the government or, you know, commercial payers. And they're obviously interested in a public health. And the way they usually term it now is population health management, you know, because they are learning as well. I think they've learned over the years that we, we, we have to treat patients as individuals, but also we're looking at our patient populations as a, as a whole, and we need to do a better job as payers to, to affect their health outcomes. And so that's kind of where there's a lot of overlap between uh, our industries. And, and then the last thing I'll, I'll kind of end with, 
which has been a recent trend, not in public health, it's been a longstanding part uh, of public health, but a recent trend in our industry is around social determinants of health and health equity and you know diversity, inclusion and belonging even within the company itself and making sure that even in our hiring practices we're, you know, we're being diverse and, and bringing in folks from you know, all different you know, races and ethnicities, you know, backgrounds, et cetera. Um, and so that has been a, a big push, I know, within my company uh, recently. And so, you know, I, those are elements that I think most people are probably unaware of, but have become important within the pharmaceutical industry. And I would say in the private sector as a whole, those things that I just mentioned are also important in other industries besides, you know, the biopharma industry. Um, but so, you know, that's kind of, that has kind of been my journey and, and, and I've been able to, even in the private sector, um, and I would say mainly because of being in the private sector, I've been able to use my population health or public health background in many different ways, whether it's healthcare quality, you know, health policy, health equity. So there's various elements of the work that I've done. And then to go full circle, and I'll end with this, is, you know, I started basically wanting to do international kind of public health. And now, you know, in my work, I have a global role. And so I'm working with colleagues, you know, in all the countries around the world. Our, our company is in over 120 countries around the world. And so I have folks that I work with in, you know, Europe, in Asia, um, you know, all over the place. And so I'm on calls every day with folks that have a global kind of accountability and remit. And so, you know, again, I've been able to use those different elements of, you know, my background in many different ways that have helped inform me and, and give me the, the expertise to do the work that I'm actually doing right now. That's great. Thank you so much, Jason. So before we move on to Julie and, you know, just based on the Q&A coming in as well, I think uh, uh, one of the attendees is really curious about how each of the panelists defines population health. I think that's a great question. And the second piece is, Jason, you know, if you could just briefly talk about uh, top of your mind, kind of like career advice for MPH students wanting to enter the public kind of like industry, is there any particular career advice? And then we will move on to, to Julie's um, after that, yeah. I'll, let me let me start first. I'll, I'll, I'll I can give my definition, but I want to give other people a chance to speak. Let me let me talk about Absolutely. advice. Yeah. Um, I, I I would say you know, you guys are at um a school. My first advice would be before you even got into school, right? Now you're already in school, but but I would say look, go to a school where there's a lot of different opportunities because you don't know in opportunities in the sense of that they're not just focused on one aspect of public health, right? That there's various aspects of public health that you can learn from. Because one example I would give, or the main example I'd give for me is I came specifically to a program that focused on what I wanted to do. But I also knew that if I switched my interests or, or uh, you know, my career uh, goals that I could I was at a place that I could easily do that and I would still get really good training. So you're at a place where you kind of have that, where, where you can shift maybe from one to the other. And, and related to that, when you're looking for opportunities, if you're unsure, even if you are sure what you want to do, just, I would, you know, I would advise try different things, right? You know, even if you're say, look, I want to focus on, you know, maternal and child health, for example, and I want to do everything related to that. I would say just maybe try something else, you know, a little bit, just, just one time, not, you know, don't change your whole life for that, but, you know, just try something that's maybe a little bit different because you're never going to know when you're going to switch. Um, and every, I, from my experience, every experience I've had has had an influence on my next experience, whether it's background, whether it's knowledge, education, whether it's networking people that I've met. Uh, and so I would just be open you know, to that, because you never know how many times your career might change, either in small ways or big ways. Thank you, Jason. Julie, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Um, before I get started, I, I do want to piggyback off of what Jason was saying about trying new things um, in your career and not feeling necessarily um, pigeonholed into one type of career because when I first started out at um, Columbia getting my degree in public health, 
I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with that degree, but I knew that I was passionate about public health and that I wanted to be a sponge and absorb everything and kind of take that two years to determine what I wanted to do. And spoiler alert, it didn't ever come to me. There was no aha moment. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life, um, which can be really scary, but it really opens you up to so many different opportunities. And I'll walk you through where I've been in my career, but I really think it goes to show that um, keeping an open mind and trying things along the way. Um, and I, I'm, I'm an advocate for this as much as the most I possibly can be because I've had some jobs that didn't work out for me and some paths that didn't work out for me, but it helped me get to where I am and where I'm eventually going. And I think that's really, really important. So a little background on what got me into public health. Um, I initially, way back in middle school and high school, was very interested in HIV and STI prevention. I was part of an AIDS peer education group in my high school where we would um, teach courses throughout the different health classes in school. Um, and I went on to do some risk behavior research in college, which I really enjoyed. And I was working with students as well. And at the, towards the end of college, really didn't know what I wanted to do with my career. Um, felt really lost. And just knowing that I really cared about public health and not much else, I applied to school and I went with it. Um, after I graduated from Mailman and um, I had a certificate in health policy and practice and a concentration in sociomedical sciences, I learned so much. It was such an amazing experience. Um, one of my favorite classes at Mailman was social determinants of health. And it's something that I use principles from in my career all of the time. Um, it was just such a great experience, but I graduated and I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I was moving to Philadelphia and feeling like I still have, it's funny because I still have a draft email in my Gmail and I don't think I'll ever delete with lists of different career opportunities in Philadelphia for me to look into. And I look back on that and I think, wow, that if I only had the knowledge now that I had then. Um, and I eventually, after looking for a few months, got a position at a generic pharmaceutical company, which sounds very off the beaten path, um, not what I was expecting as somebody that just graduated with a degree in public health, but my experience was really valued there just having a completely different perspective of really old school um, type of people who were very business focused, um, not necessarily thinking about health first. We were also a manufacturing plant. So we had a lot of chemists and manufacturers working for us. So it was a really diverse company. And I worked in business development and marketing. And I actually ended up doing primarily pipeline analysis, which was I would study what was going on in the brand market and help determine what drugs we were going to genericize, which it sounds again, very different and very not public health related. But for me, it was really cool to be a part of that strategy because um, that ultimately brings drugs to people at a more accessible price and makes it more available to them. And it's very funny when you're sitting in a meeting and they're talking about from, from the company's perspective, the market bottoming out. And I'm thinking about, well, that's really positive for patients because if these drugs are so readily available for very, very cheap, that's a good thing for patients, right? So it really gave me an opportunity to understand the pharma industry from both sides. And I really stopped seeing it as this big, bad, money, hungry, uh, only wanting to make money and not caring about patients, because the truth is, of course, there's going to be bad apples, but there are going to be a lot of people that care very much about health and innovation and some very, very smart people that want to be involved in that process. So moving along in my career, I actually ended up working for digital agencies and doing um, different types of digital work for specifically pharmaceutical and healthcare companies. So learning about it again from a different angle. Um, and what brought me to my career right now is now I'm actually a healthcare strategist and projects are very diverse. Some projects that I work on are not even necessarily healthcare focused because we are a smaller company and that's just resourcing thing. But 
Um, I just recently am starting to wrap up a project for a major pharma company where we're helping them think of really innovative breakthrough ideas on how to use technology to change patients' everyday lives and to leverage all that data and all that uh, all those resources that a pharmaceutical company has to really make positive change for patients and to help HCPs innovate so that they can diagnose faster and they can work with their patients more efficiently. So it's really come full circle for me. Um, it's been a really interesting experience. I'm learning so much every day. Um, I think um, I think that it, it, if, if you would have asked me six years ago when I graduated what I thought I would be doing, I, don't, I could never imagine it would have been something like this, but um, I think it's really important to keep an open mind. And something that I always tell people when they ask me for any type of career advice, and I think it's so, so important, you will find something that ultimately is interesting to you. You will find a career path that motivates you and that makes you want to learn and grow, right? That we all have very curious minds. You're all obviously very smart and intelligent. You're in a great program or you graduated from a great program. And I think, I think people sell ourselves a little bit short sometimes and don't advocate for themselves and don't necessarily look at a position from the lens of what are the things that aren't listed on here that I need to make sure work for me, right? So pre working from home, what, it sounds so trivial, but what is the situation like at my desk? Is it open concept? Is it a place with no windows where I'm gonna feel boxed in all the time? What is the company culture? What are the DE and I initiatives, if any, going on? How, how do you make employees feel valued? And I know that that might sound, oh, that's trivial. Everyone's doing that. But once I started asking for that during interviews, I was a lot happier in jobs because the places that don't value those things, you see that right away. And the places that do have something to talk about. So I, I would give any person starting out in, the, in their career that advice. And you can make those, you can ask for those things. You don't have to feel like, oh, well, I don't have a lot of experience. So I shouldn't be asking for things because you deserve it. So you should be able to get whatever you're looking for in a career in that, in that um, aspect. If you wanted to give a definition in terms of like uh, population health and just to better contextualize it for our attendees, you know, you're welcome to as well. I, I'm going to go from it from a digital and technology perspective because that's what I've been working on most recently. But I will say that as much as some of these fast paced and growing technologies can be really intimidating sometimes. And I definitely feel like one of those people where I thought I knew everything about what was going on in that world. And suddenly I, I don't know what half things are that I see online um, anymore. I would say that population health can really be improved by technology. And I think with some of what we have available, um, some of the AI and predictive um, analytics type of things can be so amazingly useful. And if data is leveraged properly and with care, there's really so much that can be done. And bridging that back to the conversation about being in the private sector, I know it sounds a little bit counterintuitive to work in public health in the private sector, but sometimes it's those companies that have resources that are really able to make a difference. And we are the people that will be the voices in the room advocating for public health. And if not us, who's going to be there, right? So we, we want to be those people that are the voices of public health in a room full of people that maybe don't even have much awareness of it at all. That's right. Thank you. Um, let's move on to Chris. We want to hear from you, Chris. Oh, well, thank you. And I, it's nice to back clean up because there are several things that Julie said and several things that Jason said. So I can leave some of those things on the table or I can maybe emphasize, but um, I'll start first and foremost, at least just with my take on population health. In the most simplistic terms um, for me, it's, it's the health status in aggregate of a group. That group can be defined differently. It could be the population of your neighborhood. 
it could be um, a, uh, you know, a cultural, you know, sort of enclave, if you will. It could be an age demographic, like the health of the population of 18 to 24 year olds. It could be the population health of people with, you know, living with diabetes, and you're managing that particular population. Within that population, there's tons of individuals and very individual needs and, and characteristics. And so like when Jason was talking about that he realized he didn't wanna practice medicine at the individual level and wanted to go at the population level, it's just sort of your take on things. You know, Do you want to work in, in microeconomics or macroeconomics? Do you wanna work on the individual patient or this? You can't change the health of a population without changing the health of the individual. So there's a need for both and they have to work together. But um, as Julie was talking about with regard to data and understanding and leveraging that data, um, the sky's the limit with um, artificial intelligence, with some of the predictive modeling, with some of the machine learning, some of the things we can do. We can start to more effectively understand populations and recognize the individual contributions to that population and then manage them more effectively. And I don't mean manage like manhandle manage. I mean, manage in the sense of like getting the most out of health for those people. It could be mental health. It could be emotional health. It could be spiritual health. It could be, you know, physical health. So hopefully that kind of ties a couple different things that you've heard um, both from Julie, from Jason, and then also just my perspective. But I came at things a little differently. Um, I actually started in human resources and um, was uh, recruited into the pharmaceutical industry in sales. So I came at it from the business side of things. I grew up in the company that, um, that I was with for 22 years. I held several roles, but what happened to me in that process was as I was starting to work with health plans and integrated delivery networks and employers on their population's health, I got the population health bug. I got the, I want to help change policies around treating people with diabetes. I wanted to change, um, you know, vaccination. You know, I wanted to understand vaccination policies. You know, why were some, you know, why were some states doing this? Why were some doing that? How do you leverage that? How do you change that? And, and so for someone like me, I was very involved in um, prevention, wellness, chronic disease management. I was in a host of roles um, across the organization and ultimately ended up in a role that was in our government affairs group um, at Santa Fe, a large biopharmaceutical company and vaccine company. And actually for me, the more I was engaging with government personnel, policymakers, um, academics, researchers, community organizers, people running health systems and health plans, I felt like I was always bringing the, who's gonna pay for this and the business perspective, which is important. It's absolutely important. I needed to balance a little of that with, I cared, but sometimes maybe was I being taken seriously? Had I thought of everything? And I really pursued a master's in public health to sort of provide that academic balance as well as, um, coursework and um, research opportunities and just even the doors that open, quite frankly, and the, you know, the, the perception changes. Um, because I had been in the biopharmaceutical se sector for 22 years, um, I've heard everything, Big, big Bad Pharma, um, Darth Vader, you know, all of those things. And I see Jason laughing. We've been in a lot of those same rooms called the same thing. Um, I know that without innovation, we're never gonna find cures to cancer. We're never going to help people walk with multiple sclerosis. We're never going to arrest, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. We're never going to find um, thing, you know, supportive treatments for um, rare diseases, not to mention vaccinations that are, you know, obviously a hot topic today. And just even the chronic management for people with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We've done fantastic things, but we haven't arrested it. So we need to have good management strategies. So what you need is you need people that are in that mix, Julie said it, at that table, having those conversations, because you need the business people that are opening those doors 
and finding the capital, if you will, to, to do that. But you also need people that understand that population health management piece, that understand the intersection with the public health sector, um, that can recognize that you can't work on a group of people in aggregate until you work on the individual. And how does that get changed? Um, I'm still very passionate about the economics and the benefits of people. Um, and from that perspective, uh, so I think I pull my HR experience back to the forefront. Um, I don't believe any one individual nor any one company should go bankrupt because of healthcare costs. And so to me, at the end of the day, my, what you know fuels me is spending the money we have in healthcare smarter, doing things more effectively putting more money in prevention so that we can reap the reward with longer, longer, more, um, uh, you know, high quality lives. Like Jason, I spent a, a significant amount of time in quality and value. And the organization that I'm with now is actually a consulting organization that works in healthcare quality and healthcare value specifically. Um, it's part of a broader organization that um, does everything from medical education, health, um, health economics outcomes research, they do advertising and marketing, and they do um, digital analysis, um, a lot of work on social listening to kind of understand um, what patients say to the doctor, what they might say to the nurse might be very different than what they say to a fellow patient in, an, in a chat room or something like that. And so how are we understanding that? And it's a whole new way of looking at the patient experience. It's a whole new way of looking at pharmacovigilance, quite honestly, are, are people saying things that companies need to know. Um, so that's a little bit about me and my background. I, I want to kind of jump into some things that I know Alden wanted us to touch on is, um, and Jason mentioned it and, and Julie touched on it. It's if, you know, one of the things that put me where I am is I took risks. I said, yes, I did try something I didn't totally understand or wasn't sure. And you know, I, I didn't go into it with one, this is what I'm going to do. And it did evolve. Um, it did, oddly enough, the way Jason's ended up back in the global, oddly enough, a lot of the things um, I'm ending up back with are sort of the, you know, the health economics, the the sort of the health benefits, the employer, you know, the the, the payment, you know, piece of it. So there's, there's a lot of full circle there too. Um, the other thing I would say is, don't be afraid to look at the companies that are doing things in healthcare because they need your experience, they need your expertise and your perspective. As Julie mentioned, as Jason mentioned, big organizations are, they want to hear from, just like, um, you know, if you think about Amazon or Google or anyone that's, you know, getting the, you know, getting information to make your shopping experience smarter or to target you more effectively. Health healthcare is a very personal, very specific individual thing. The better we understand the, the piece of that, the more we can connect it and the more effective it will be. If you think about like um, something that's very important is taking your medication. Julie mentioned something about the generic version is, you know, that might lower a cost barrier. Well, what if you have a hard time swallowing pills, you know, that type of thing. Someone has to be in there working with the organizations to find out, can this be crushed up and put in applesauce and still be effective? You know, someone has to know the motivational interviewing techniques and the, um, you know, understand social determinants of health to understand maybe why someone wouldn't take their medication as prescribed. Why are there some inherently skeptical opinions in the African American community of the healthcare industry? Why is that potentially leading to vaccine hesitancy? Those are very big, important issues. They are major and they advance health the better we understand them. We're not going to come in and fix it, but we can't we can't do anything until we understand it more effectively. And people with a public health mindset, people with your training are more apt to do that than maybe someone that's completely come through the business side of it. On the flip side, I don't think anybody would want maybe, you know, to be running a major corporation and having a profit and loss statement and things like that. There's things that we're not good at. 
you know, that there's people that need to run the business side of things or do the drug innovation side of things or to do that kind of thing. We need to, but we need to play our part so they can do that. Um, and the other thing I'll just touch on um, real quickly is on um, internships and mentorships. I think, I think people, when, you know, a lot of people will be like, how do I get a mentor? Or I feel weird asking or something like that. Julie and Jason, I reached out to them to say, hey, would you guys be willing to do this panel? Both of them were like, sure, because we've all been helped by someone. We've all been touched by someone. Someone has changed our trajectory, coached us along or something like that. But if I could give one or two pieces of advice on mentorship, if you're going to ask someone to mentor you, have something specific. I would like to get into digital health, Julie. Um, would you be willing to work with me on my resume? Would you be willing to prep me for an interview? You know, would you be willing to like something specific? It doesn't have to be specific and discreet. It could be a, a year long relationship. But as we've all benefited from mentors, we all want to men mentor people, but you, you kind of can't, it can't be like a, I mean, unless it's a child you're raising, can't be like an 18 year endeavor. So, you know, if you can kind of approach someone with that kind of mindset, I think it's much more manageable and you don't feel so weird asking. So that's that. And then the other thing I would say is regarding internships, many, many more internships are paid um, than they used to be. And so I would say to Jason's advice and Julie's advice is try something different, maybe an internship. I know Julie had an internship. That's how we met initially. And I don't think it was something that she was necessarily, you know, thinking was going to be her end all be all, but it changed her disposition about the private sector and every, like she said, everything she's done since has layered on. And so I would say, be willing to take those risks, take those, in, you know, those internships. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chris. I, I love the fact that you mentioned about being specific when asking mentors to provide mentorship, because uh, to me, I think, you know, one of the uh, conventional wisdom I've read about is mentors can also gain a lot from mentoring others. So when, you know, as the mentee, when you're being more specific in terms of uh, uh, how you would like to receive particular mentorship, it makes things easier for the mentors to also figure out, you know, this is what I can gain from this. So it creates a win-win situation. So mm -hmm. I think that's a great, that's a great recommendation. And I just love how, you know, it sounds like just hearing from yourself, from Jason, from Julie, there's no one particular way to approach population health management, but population health on its own, it's, it's a huge uh, kind of like endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be thinking about quality and access. You can be thinking about AI data and stuff like that. Uh, um, so it, it encompasses many different forms. So I think one question I have, and then I'll move on to Anna and Jess to see if they've got any questions on behalf of the students is that um, I think, you know, the, the public, the, the drop market is getting more and more competitive, right? So, I have a feeling that it's no longer enough to just say, you know, I have a course uh, that teach that, you know, on social determinants of health, or I have a course, you know, I took a course on, you know, the, the, the basics of uh, what population health management could be. So I'm wondering from your respective uh, positions, um, if we wanted to be a little bit more competitive in the job market to be, you know, driving these, to, to be uh, entering these positions, are there particular skills or the particular kind of like competencies that you think will be more important to accentuate doing a job hunting process as opposed to just, you know, yeah, obviously all of us, we need entry level uh, knowledge on social determinants of health. Is there anything else that you think is unique that students should focus on while they're completing the programs right now? Um, this isn't the, the most exciting of answers, but I think some of those technical skills are great to have at an entry level position. Um, I remember I had an opportunity to take a class to learn how to use Excel better. And I kind of scoffed at it thinking, oh, I know how to do that. And then I, jokes on me, learned in my first job, I didn't know anything about Excel. So it sounds silly, but even if it's something you want to do on your own or take a formal class, um, all, of, all of those tips and tricks are available online for free also. So if you just like to play around with data and numbers, um, you can take some YouTube tutorials, um, how to do pivot tables and run macros and things like that. So beefing up with any technical skills, using any um, of those like proprietary databases, IQVIA Health, 
or Sisian or oh, there's so many, but just familiarizing yourself with those tools that a lot of um, companies do use. There's a lot of overlap in between. So I think that that can really set you apart. And lastly, I would say, I mean, of course it depends on, on what you want to do ultimately, but doing really good research on what, so if you're interviewing somewhere, doing really comprehensive research on not only what they do and what they're conveying like on their website, but really digging into, and even if it's contacting somebody that works there and asking some questions, um, really digging into what their mission and goals are and not just not just the stuff that they're writing on their on their website, which is always very broad and doesn't always tell you what your day to day is going to look like. But if you go into an interview, really understanding what their true business goals are in a less broad and a more specific perspective, I think that that can really set you apart. Yeah, no, I I agree on with everything Julie said. I just to add a couple things. One is I interview a lot, right? Not not just for you know, somebody I'm hiring, but for my colleagues, you know, I'm usually anything in the area that I'm working in, they'll pull me in to interview. And one of the things I look for is diversity and not, I, I mean, experience diversity, not, you know, obviously we're looking for other things, like I mentioned earlier about racial and ethnic, but, but wow, this person did this job in the financial industry, and then they actually went into education and then they went into, you know, biotech, what, you know, why did they, because that to me sparks a bunch of questions. And that's what I like to ask somebody to interview about, like, why did you do these different things? Um, and to make sure that they, now, if somebody's just doing this because they can't hold a position in one industry and they're moving, obviously that'll come out, but, but it's like, well, th that this person was thoughtful, right? They wanted to get a lot of different experiences and they understood how one experience is going to relate to another and kind of help them grow in what they're doing. And so I really look for that kind of, um, whether it's educational or occupational diversity, you know, because that that is something when you have, you know, three or four people that have kind of similar educational backgrounds, similar work experiences, you know, that's something that's going to set you apart, that you did actually something different, but it you know why you did it and how it influenced where you are today. Um, so that's one thing I would say for people who are starting out. The other thing I'm going to say for people who are moving, like if they have a job and, and hopefully you remember this after you've had a job, but one of the things that has been ingrained in me, I've learned is you never know what aspect of your job now is going to influence what you're doing in the future. And I can give a specific example. When I worked for a nonprofit, I was the chief medical officer of this small nonprofit that focused on a lot of prevention research. A very small aspect of what I did was related to healthcare quality. And another small aspect of what I did was actually related to legislation and health policy. Even though I really liked health policy, that wasn't a major part of what I was doing in that job. But those two things were why I was hired and interviewed for the position I'm in now right? Some recruiter saw that I had that experience, which wasn't a major part of my position at that time, but they saw that and they said, oh, this, this person would be good for this position. And then I got hired. So, so you never know what you're doing right now, whether it's at school or in a job is going to impact what you're doing in the future. So I would say never dismiss stuff like that, even if it seems minor, always think about, you know, this, whatever it is might be, you know, beneficial for me in the future. I think the only thing I would add is it's taking that and just saying, if you've written a paper or you've been on, a, you've done a project or you've done something and you, and it really sparked your interest and you've, you know, because you've read how many articles and you've done a lit search and you've done that. And so you feel a little more familiar with something, try to see how that would apply in the job that you're applying for, or that you would be interested in, because Oftentimes organizations have to do research and do that kind of thing to understand that you already have that piece of it done. What you need to do is be able to translate to them how it transfers or how it could support a, a theory or a strategy or something. And if there's some original thinking with that, like Jason, when I interview people, I'm looking for how you would how you would take that information and, and leverage it and where would you go with it or who would you reach out to or what who who needs to know this 
And it's not that you're an expert in it, but you're, you're on that path. And it also helps to show if you're passionate about something, if it's a topic that you're passionate about, that comes through in the interview as well. It doesn't mean that you've spent, I mean, if you're just out of school, you haven't spent 37 years doing something. So don't expect that. Take what you have done and, and show how it's, you know, how it's relevant to, to what you want to do. That's great. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, Jason, and Julie. And Chris, you know, in, our, in, in the management classes, we use a lot of business cases. So they're kind of like specific, but this is just, this is a great advertisement. Well, why, why we use business cases? Because as you talk about these cases, you know, we, students are forced to really translate what we are learning from one organization to, you know, to generalizing, generalizing that across other organizations as well. All right, Anath and Jess, um, do you want to share some of the questions that are coming from our students? So one of the questions we received um, is, uh, what are your recommendations for teams within um, orgs, organizations that public health students should be looking into when applying for roles in the private sector, uh, whether that be government affairs, advocacy? Yeah, so there's some natural places like government affairs, advocacy, um, there's patient engagement roles. Um, there are, you know, divisions of population health management. Um, you know, I know that was in Jason, I think two titles ago for Jason. Um, but, you know, so there are those kinds of roles and positions. Um, I think um, communications is also another place. And you might not think that because you think it's all glossy and that kind of thing. But health education and having a foundation in health education and communicating co very complex things in very concise ways is probably one of the keys to health improvement. And so someone that understands maybe they've been in um, public facing roles, they've had internships or been on projects or done, um, you know, work like, you know, Julie was describing in risk, um, you know, uh, management or health behavior change and things like that. So I would say communications, government affairs, um, uh, advocacy, population management, research and development too, because you, they also need people to engage patients and um, you know to set up clinical trials. They might be working to do um, to do a better job of recruiting patients of uh, maybe particular um, minority groups to make sure that there's appropriate representation in the clinical trial. And so there might be community outreach as a part of that. And so those are kind of the places I would start. Yeah, let me just, I, I just wanna emphasize what you said. So, so two, two main points. One is when, I, when there was a public health group that I worked at at Pfizer, we focused on health literacy. So we had to partner with communications, right? Because that was the other aspect of the company. So just to you know, you know, reiterate what Chris said, um, in, in my company, all of that falls under corporate affairs. So you have communications, you have advocacy. The other aspect, almost every major company has a foundation that focuses on pu public health, it, like health education or other aspects of public health. If you have a company that like Chris's former company that makes vaccines, you're going to have, you know, you're, you're going to have that aspect, whether it's the foundation or patient access parts of the company that focus on making sure, you know, patients get uh, vaccines. And then, and then the one other thing I'll mention is um, medical. So sometimes that's R&D, sometimes it's not, um, but, but the, the medical, because there, it's not just the clinical aspects, but other aspects uh, of medical. And sorry, I thought of one more thing too, because of what something Chris said, we have an, a, a part of our company that really focuses on, on data um and it's called the you know it's it's about observational research and stuff but it's really focused on real world data and they are really getting into population health because there's so much data available and a lot of you know i know the work that that both chris and julie have done you know focus on how you can apply real world data populate to population health issues and so that's another aspect of a company that you can look into so i mean it just kind of emphasizes that you know there's so many different parts of the company um, that actually can touch different aspects of population health. Um, going off of that, someone asked, how do life science companies transform disease data into not only therapeutic products, but assist with concrete ways to help those patients connect and understand how their habits um, impact their health outcomes? 
I can take a crack or Julie, this is kind of up your alley from some prior work that you did. <laughs> go for it and then I'll go after you. Okay. Um, so me, as we were talking about managing the individual to help manage the population, um, data helps us do that. And so for example, um, something that Jason and I are very um, involved with is value-based insurance design. And it's basically structuring your benefit so that the, you know, so there's more incentive for you to buy, take, access high value health services and leave the things that aren't as important on the side. And the reason, you know, by lowering co-pays, by making things free, by, you know, making access to things more easily. Um, and so, for example, you can take artificial intelligence, you can take that data, and you can understand that maybe a group of patients with these, you know, let's just say 100 different inputs are less likely to respond to what we would call maybe the first line or second line therapy. So is it fair to make that patient pay out of pocket, use their careful resources, healthcare resources, and spend money on drug one, treatment two, and they're still not getting the clinical result. But through AI, we might be able to know if they have this genetic makeup, if they have this particular, um, you know, um, ethnographic sort of background, if there's this, if there's, you know, those, these types of components, this person will respond better to this biologic agent so let's just skip one and two, not even waste the time or money. Let's go right there. That patient takes that, they get the health results they want. And we, it was more efficient. And efficiency in the long run is more cost effective. And that's higher value. That's just one take on it. But I'd be interested to hear what the others say. Sure. Jess, would you actually mind repeating the question? I want to make sure I get the details of it. Yeah, so this person asked, how do life science companies transform disease data into not only therapeutic products, but assist with concrete ways to help these patients connect and understand how their habits impact their health outcomes? Hmm, that's a really good question. I think, I think the capabilities are there. I don't know that the functionality is there right now. Um, it's funny because I think I kind of work in the agency world on some projects like that. And in, in ideating uh, around these, around basically ways to leverage data, um, there's so much opportunity. And I think there's so much still to be done. And I think that public health experts are the ones who can drive that forward because there's so many people who are so amazingly skilled with data, but they might not know exactly what to do with it from public health perspective. So I know that this is kind of a nebulous answer, but I'm, I work on things like this and I have a lot of hope for, for projects like this to be brought to the market in the not too distant future. Um, and my, my, my real answer would be that if it's something that you're interested in, please reach out to me um, I can talk to you about it more, but this is, there's definitely careers in that. And there's a lot of opportunity there. That's great. And, you know, we have a couple of uh, minutes left. And I think one question that I'd be really curious to hear what the panelists have got to say is that because of COVID, the pandemic, and, and I think there's a lot of like interest uh, uh, and resources around mental health, well-being, and at the same time, also around health equity and kind of like inequalities and stuff like that. So I'm wondering if each of the panelists can briefly describe some of the efforts that are kind of like a, a underway, either in your own organization or um, with colleagues that you know about that kind of like driving efforts around well-being as well as kind of like health equity. You want me to go first? I'll, I'll go first and then let the other two. Um, so I'm going to take this in different steps. One is for my company, the, in the pandemic, the first focus of the company, in addition to, okay, we make medicines, patients need to get those medicines, right? They need to have access. But the second was, and maybe this was even first in the very beginning, the safety and well-being of the company itself and the employees. That was the focus of our leadership, right? Are our employees safe? What can we do to make sure they're safe if they're not? 
and safe not just from not getting infected and getting sick, but also safe from a you know a behavioral or mental health aspect too. You know, how are they dealing with this? How can we and and how can we make even their work life easier or better? And so there's been a lot of talk, and not just our company, many companies about you know work life balance and flexibility and remote working and all things related to that. So so I think we started with that. We don't have, um, I would say, we don't have a portfolio in kind of mental mental health, you know, products, but still we realize how important that is and how it affects other aspects of patients' health. So I think the second thing that we are still focused on, and we haven't seen the full effects of this, is what we and others call the secondary health crisis. We've started to see some of this, but we're going to see more of this in the years to come. And that's because of the pandemic, how are people not getting what they need healthcare wise, whether it's, and, and this can be mental health, physical health, chronic disease, whatever. They're not getting the screenings they need. They're not seeing the clin clinicians, whether it's doctors or other health professionals that they need. They're not getting the treatments they need. And we are going to see the effects of that many, many years you know, down the road. How can we kind of address those, those things right now? And then the last thing I want to mention, because I, on you mentioned about health, health equity. So we've seen a lot about health equity, you know, particularly around, you know, vaccine distribution and access and stuff like that. Um, it, I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of the social justice stuff, it happened kind of during the, you know, the, the middle of the pandemic last year. And so those issues kind of both came together. Um, we were already kind of focused on that, but we're even focusing on that more so than in the past, right? What can we do? Who can we partner with to address health equity issues? Whether it's social determinants of health, you know, whether it's other aspects of disparities, what can we do? So I'll just give you a brief example. We have a product that's going to be launched um, in, next year on asthma. Um, and as hopefully everyone on this knows, there's many social determinants of health, you know, related to asthma, whether it's housing or transportation, stuff like that. And so, so we've partnered with, you know, you know, academic medical centers on how, what are the biggest social determinants of health? How can we address those when it comes to asthma and, and other diseases, but just focusing on that because we have a, you know, a, a, we have a, a big interest in that area. And what can we do to affect those, you know, because again, for my company and, and I'm, you know, Chris's old company, Julie's old company, other companies, you know, the, the goal is, you know, and our mission statement is to serve patients. So we can, we need to do that and not just innovating and supplying medicine, but there are other aspects to care that are important to that. And so that's one of the things we've been addressing kind of in the midst of, of the pandemic and hopefully as we're coming out of it. And Chris and Julie, would you have uh, kind of like any comments to add? We're running a little bit, you know, over time, but I still think it's, it would be wonderful to hear uh, if you have something else to um, add at this point. Jason's answer gave me so many different thoughts <laughs> that I honestly forgot what we were originally talking about. <laughs> He was saying how I was I was just visiting friends this weekend and one of them is um, a gastroenterologist and she was just talking about how so many people missed their colonoscopies over the last two years and how that's how she's curious to see in 10 years what that data looks like. Um, and then I lost my complete train of thought. So can you just remind me what I'm supposed to be ending off on? <laughs> Well, we're just curious about, you know, if there are particular efforts around kind of like health equity or mental health slash well-being, just uh, uh, that um, these issues have just become a lot more um, prominent because of the pandemic. Absolutely. Um, from my experience, I think companies are all pivoting in the right direction. And kind of, as I mentioned earlier about advocating for yourself, there are a lot of opportunities nowadays, even as compared to four, three, four years ago, where... Um, mental health really is valued and mental health days are valued and taking off without having to provide a medical note or some sort of legitimate excuse is valued. Um, so as a public health professional, don't forget about yourself. You are number one. You're not going to do your job well if you're not feeling well, physically, emotionally, et cetera. So look for those places that are going to value all of that, ask those questions and um, also, with, in regards to health equity, I would say if you're very interested in things like DE&I, ask truly what companies are doing for DE&I, because of course, last year we saw a huge uptick in hiring for DE&I positions, and then 
a lot of people just kind of abandoned it. So if that's something interesting to you, make sure you ask about that because there are a lot of companies doing the right thing. Thank you, Julie. Chris, any uh, concluding remarks? Quick, quick thing, and this is a very specific, discreet, it's not wide and everything, but um, so the organization that I work for um, has participated in the Black Co Coalition on COVID. And this is actually um, African-American healthcare providers um, uh, from all different geographies across the United States coming together to work on some of the um, hesitancy issues, on some of the you know symptom um, you know recognition, on just general um, the mental health aspect, the support. This had many different tentacles to it. I think it was on Good Morning America. There's been you know I mean it, it was kind of if you were ever talking about like a healthcare campaign, it sort of hit many different things. But this is something that is a very discreet and specific audience touches on multiple things and the intent is um, to elevate the people practicing medicine and you know sort of uh, also recruitment in medical schools and different you know I mean it just touched on several different areas and it just you know with the idea that it was helping the COVID piece it was helping sort of the um, the, the equity piece it was helping the um, you know just sort of um, lowering some of the resistance and hesitancy. So that's just like one example. That's just a quick one. Right. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, well, you know, this is a great panel. I've enjoyed and I've learned so much just from the panelists as well. I would like to thank everyone, uh, uh, Chris, Chris, Jason and Julie for taking, uh, for graciously agreeing to, to be part of this panel, for taking your time and also Jess and Anna for being here and also Andrea and uh, Chris Alexander for helping us to organize the event. Thank you so much, uh, everyone else, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the session. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good luck, everybody.